And I think what I'd like to do is maybe just talk for 10, 15 minutes or so. And then what I would like is us to have a conversation. And I think this kind of, these kind of numbers are perfect for this. And we can maybe all get uh, something a little bit more out of it. Um, and I think the newcomers, if I can just ask you to come over this side, please. You can sit at the back, but just over this way. So as you know, I'm here to talk about Julius Malema, who is the subject of, of my book, a book called An Inconvenient Youth. The subtitle is Julius Malema, The New ANC. And the word new is in single inverted commas. And the reason for the subtitle, and the reason we wanted to try and talk about that first, is that it's not strictly a biography of Julius Malema, but his character and his place within the ANC allowed me to write a book as well about the ANC. And in situating him within the ruling party, and looking at him, the kind of character he is, a uh, pop star, is one of probably the nicer, nicer ways to describe Julius. <laughs> um, it, it, it allowed me to write something that's more of a political biography of Julius Malema, and a book that makes a very long statement about the ANC. And it's also, for any of you who've read it, there are three very dense history chapters in there as well. So it's not a strict biography. Um, but he was, he is the main subject, it, it is a book about him, and it's also an unauthorised book. But in writing that book, I had two years unlimited access to Julius. Um, I went where he went, I was in Venezuela with him, um, if you remember that trip. I was with him in Harare when uh, Terra Blanche was murdered. Um, and I used to sit with him at his house in Santon, and we would just sit, just the two of us, and talk. And I structured my time with him in a very informal way. Um, I didn't, everything was recorded, but I didn't take notes. Some things weren't recorded, it was purely from my background. But it allowed me to understand the person. It allowed me to understand his politics. And it gave me uh, the most fantastic insight into the ANC. Julius gave me amazing briefings, uh, great up updates on what was happening within the party. And if you go back to when I started working on this, which was two years ago this month, and Julius and I had met the year, a year earlier. If you think of his falling out with, with Zuma, it had happened already by then. So it was always within that very tense environment that he has found himself in in the last couple of years. He and I no longer talk. Um, since the book came out, we've, we don't speak. Because the time that I spent with Julius was trying to understand him, and trying to understand his politics, trying to understand the ANC. Separate to that, I did some very big investigations into his money affairs, into his businesses, into uh, dealings that were erring, always on the wrong side of right. And he felt I exposed too much corruption in the book. But that was the joy of having an unauthorised biography. And thanks to him that he did give me the opportunity to stay close to him for as long as I did, he trusted me. And even though he doesn't like what's exposed in the book, it is his story. Um, and I think if he doesn't like it, he has to change it rather than change the book change his ways rather than change the book. But then the book would launch just, I think it was the, the last week or so of August, and it was five days after the ANC disciplined Julius. And that discipline that came during the NEC meeting at the end of August is what's playing out now. We still don't have the final word on it. We're waiting for the appeals committee to say whether he's going to be suspended, expelled, or whether they want to seek a political solution to this. So the book had a strange life because it, I think it was Jenny Cruz Williams who said, your Fiona Ford has a bone in the butter. And I had and I happened because the, it gave the book fantastic marketing, his demise, uh, his woes, his, his downfall. But at the same time, it, the book only goes so far. And I think the next chapter on Julius Malema is going to be really, really intriguing. Uh, I'm not sure that whatever decision is reached over the next few days by the Appeals Committee of the ANC, whether that's the final say on Julius Malema. I know we have at least one ANC member in the room who's uh, hiding down at the back there. But this is a huge, hugely important year for the ANC. Um, at the end of this year, they'll decide on the incoming leadership. They'll decide who's going to lead the party for the next five years. It's very competent positions within the ANC. And I think it's important, and I hope all of you here understand some degree of ANC politics. If not, please raise your hands at any time and stop me and ask questions. I had to ask a lot of questions when I was researching this as well. But there's a big distinction, obviously, between the ANC Youth League and the ANC, the mother body. It's the mother body that's holding its own internal elections in December. A lot is at stake. 
Jacob Zuma's future is at stake. Julius Malema was going to threaten that, and as a result of that, Julius found himself where he is today, which is on the fringes or about to reside on the fringes of the party. But even if the even if the ANC decides, or the ANC Appeals Committee decides over the next few days they're going to suspend him or sus expel him, my firm belief is that this is not the final call on Julius Malema. Because within the ANC, it's not the leadership that decides what this party does and doesn't do. It's the rank and file. It's the membership. It's the rank and file that gave us Jacob Zuma five years ago. It's the rank and file who decided to get rid of Tabo and Becky. All we know right now is that a certain portion of the leadership has spoken. As the leadership that controls the disciplinary committee and another section controlling the appeals committee. That's not the rank and file. The rank and file will speak next December when they decide whether Jacob Zuma holds on to his tenure within the party. And the rank and file, if they unseat Jacob Zuma, are likely to bring in six new leaders. And that's the, the, the ANC leadership. It's made up of a president, deputy president, chairman, um, secretary general, deputy secretary general, and treasurer. This new incoming six, and I believe we may see a new leadership coming in in December, are most likely to be favorable, more favorable to Julius Mulema than the current leadership. And this new leadership can decide to overturn the decisions that have been taken this month, last month, and last November when he was first suspended. They will also bring in a new disciplinary committee. They'll bring in a new appeals committee. So this is one has, has got legs for quite some time. And my firm belief is that the ANC have made a very, very big mistake in dealing with Julius the way they have. I think the reason he was suspended was because he was too vocal for this leadership. I think this leadership hasn't been a very solid leadership. I think Jacob Zuma has been lacking on many occasions. Yes, he stepped up to the plate on plenty of occasions. One was last week at the State of the Nation address. But there were many times since he took over the, the reins of the party in 2007 and the, the presidency of the country in 2009 that Jacob Zuma has left a void. And that void has largely been filled by Julius Malema. He allowed Malema to come up through the ranks. I don't think Mbeki would have tolerated Malema. And when I talk about tolerating him, I mean Tolerating the fact that a 30 year old, 28 year old, 29 year old, 30 year old, and that's what Julius was when he started to redefine our country's politics, could actually outshine a sitting president. It is a fact that he is the latest thing out of, out of South Africa, if not Africa. It was Julius who began to talk about the big issues that the whole world is watching right now, which is nationalisation. And it's all because Jacob Zuma could never stand up to him. That's where, that's where we are today. My belief is that. Even if he goes, even if he's on the outside, it's not where Jacob Zuma wants him either. If he's suspended, there's nothing stopping Julius Malema from calling a rally here or anywhere else from now until next December and try and lobby people intimately to say this is why we must get rid of Jacob Zuma. This is why we must bring in whoever he wants to replace him. He says it's Mudlati. They can't suspend him again. They can't punish him for doing that. So they've actually given him so much rope that rather than hang himself, he could hang the agency, hang the leadership. Wasn't entirely wise, wasn't very, very clever for what they've done. There's a chapter in my book called It's Complicated. And in that book, I try to explain why I think we had a dilemma. And I want to try and use that, which is very, very brief today, to say why I think we're going to have a dilemma kind of politics, if not dilemma with us for quite some time to come. Because while I, I firmly believe that it was a lack of leadership within the ANC that gave us Malema, that allowed him to rise to the heights that he did, and I do believe he had real power. I don't think it was fictional. I don't believe the critics who say he was a figment of our imagination, he's over, he, he never really had any real power. He did. He had very, very real power. Because what Malema did was to look to a constituency that has been largely ignored since 1994. And I hate to use the term, but this is the short term that captures this constituency best, and they call the masses. Horrible, horrible term to describe so many millions of people that comprise the bulk of the population of this country. But if our new census that's been calculated at the moment is going to throw up a figure of about 56, 7, 8 million people, I would safely argue that the masses would comprise about 42 or 43 million of those, maybe 40, 41. And there was a very good press statement um, put out by the ANC Youth League in the middle of September. At that stage, Julius had been disciplined by the party. The ANC Youth League was reeling as was Malema himself. They didn't know how they were going to handle this. And he announced that he was going to have the economic, the long walk to economic freedom. You remember that from Johannesburg to Pretoria. To flag that, and he flagged it six weeks ahead of the, the march itself. A massive run in time. I've never seen such a long in run in time 
pronounce anything in my life. But he basically called on a number of groups of people to join him in that march. And obviously what he was doing to Jacob Zuma was to say, if you don't, if you want to expel me from this party, or if you want to suspend me, this is the way you can expect to deal with me. This is how I will conduct my politics. And he sent out a, an email, and I'm on the mailing list, as are hundreds of thousands of people on the mailing list at the ANC, their media briefings, calling for, a, as I say, the following groups to join him in this walk. He called for the youth, the unemployed, the underemployed, the landless, shack dwellers, people who are affected by a lack of service delivery, people who are affected by a lack of electricity provision, um, petrol pump attendants, waitress, waitresses, and there was one other group in there, but when you begin to define those, even starting with the unemployed alone, then you can easily put a figure on the masses that is, exceeds 40 million. And that's who Julius Malema has been speaking to since 2009, because it really was in 2009 that he began to appear on the national radar. He was elected as ANC Youth League President in the April of 2008. And obviously Julius was on a steady upward march in Limpopo long before then. But in 2009 it was interesting because his job was, was pretty much over and done with. He had been one, not the only one, but one of the foremost of Jacob Zuma's foot soldiers when Zuma was on his comeback campaign. And that began in 2005 at the NGC when the ANC decided to stand up, the rank and file, stand up to Mbeki after Zuma had been sacked as deputy president of the country to say we're not taking this. This will be our man, this will how we fight you to get rid of you. From that time forward, Fikile Mbulula was another very prominent face, Judas was there, Gavi was there, lots of people with Zuma to try and unseat Mbeki. Zuma, or Mbulula was, was worth his weight in gold when it came to Polokwane, even though Limpopo in its entirety didn't vote uh, Zuma, they voted Mbeki. Um, but he was very good at lobbying around the country. He then became ANC Youth League President a few months later. Polokwane Conference was December 2007. He became the ANC Youth League President four months later in the April 2008. A disputed vote that was settled in the June of 2000 and 2008. Just days before the June 16 rally. And the Lemme stood up on that podium that day. That was the first time we began to get a, a sense of him. And he said he would kill for Jacob Zuma. Now, if you remember that, that's, that's how firm and staunch she was back then. The alliance, the so-called Zuma alliance, was so firm that a week later, as well as Zuma Valley came out and said, I'll feel for Zuma too. Now, if you look at how pathetic it is to this day, Zuma and Malema can no longer talk. Vavi is also the enemy of Jacob Zuma. Zuma, Vavi is not talking to Julius Malema. And this is what's been happening within the ANC, this awful state of flux that's creating this incoherency, this chaos that we have to live with because they are the ruling party sitting under their support. But go back to that time, Jacob Zuma still had the corruption charges hanging over his head. He was president of the party, but he was heading into the general elections of April, May 2009, and he had to get rid of those charges somehow. And Malema was worth his weight in gold in fighting that campaign for Zuma, constantly calling for Shalosi to be acquitted, for his man to be freed, for justice to be brought. You remember it all yourselves. You lived through it as much as I did. As we all know, the charges were dropped from over Zuma Center on the eve of the general elections. And if you think of it, Malema's job was all but done. He'd been a really valiant foot soldier. But what was he going to do? Go back and lead the youth league? And in Malema's mind, he decided not to do that. The ANC Youth League is a fantastic constituency and a fantastic base, a fantastic platform to have, but way too small for the ambitions that this guy had developed in his head. Because within the ANC, he could see the possibilities of politics. He could see how things could be so easily turned on their heads. He saw how easy it was to unseat Tabo and Becky. Not because everybody was with Jacob Zuma, and that's the, the critical point in all of this. Just they wanted to unseat one man who was in Becky, and to do it they had to coalesce around a figure who happened to be Zuma. Of course, that glue was never going to be tight enough to last to this day, and that's why all of those factions have since begun to emerge. What Malema did then was to look to the masses. And if you think of his message that he has trotted out since 2009, Malema has talked to the masses and not to the youth. He talked to nationalisation. I see the young man in front of me yawning. I hope it's not my talk, is it? No. He talked about nationalisation. He said he wanted a distribution of the country's wealth. He wanted to try and free this country from what he called, you know, thought was economic apartheid. He pushed for that. Then he talked, turned to land reform. He talked about the slow uh, program that was in place, the fact that the country could no longer deliver on its promises of land reform. 
He talked big picture issues because he was talking to the people who've been marginalised. He was basically saying to them, you are worthless. You're sitting on the margins of the new South Africa. And in the new South Africa, if you cannot consume, you cannot participate. You're only worth, you're worth your weight of gold gain see when you vote for them. And in return, 15 million of you get a social grant. But you're actually worthless. And why are you worthless? You're worthless because the white people have too much. He couldn't say you're worthless because the ANC is not looking after you properly. He had to look after his own party. But think back on his messages and what he was saying. Think back on how he started to reinterpret history. He's the only one of the ANC who goes back to carefully interpret history to suit his own aims. He talks late 1940s. He talks the formation of the ANC Youth League. He talks about the militancy of Mandela, of Tambo, of all of them from that time who started the Youth, Youth League and effectively took over the ANC in 1949 when they were the majority of the National Executive Committee, which at the time had only 20 plus members. He talks about the Freedom Charter, goes up to 1955, therein a fantastic talking point for him because it talks about the distribution of wealth, which is what he wants when he talks nationalisation. But Malema can never go beyond that. He can't go to the Morogoro Conference of 1969 in Tanzania. And that conference was critical because it talked about ridding the ANC of the very, very narrow African nationalism that had begun to take over the party. Malema could never go there. He had to stop in 1955 because he too was guilty of this narrow African nationalism. So it was a very careful, very, very clever interpretation of ANC history. He did that, he stayed on message. Every single one of you in this room could have written the book that I wrote because Malema is actually very easy to read. He's a very transparent politician. Every single one of us knows what he stands for. I'm not sure if all of you would agree with me, but in your hearts you know that he has not been a very genuine politician. He's had his hand in the cookie jar, it would seem, according to the evidence that's out there. And his message has not always been, been genuine. He talks about distributing the wealth. And if you look at the wealth that he has amassed for one single man with one four-year-old son, the two messages don't meet. But there was nobody else talking. There was nobody else trotting out that line, and that's why Malema could stay where he was. Look at Jacob Zuma. I cannot, for the life of me, tell you what Jacob Zuma stands for. He's been president of the country for three years now. I don't know if it's pro-nationalization. I don't know if it's education. I don't know if it's African Renaissance. I don't know what it is. And that's the difference between Malema and others. Malema is actually a very, very good politician. He's actually brilliant. And I don't can't see the guy doing anything other than staying in politics. I don't agree with his politics, but he's got skill, political skill, like very few people have, not just in this country, but anywhere in the world. It's very difficult to find a good politician. And Julius Malema has it, somebody with good skill. And don't confuse what I'm saying. I'm not saying I support him. I'm saying his skill is there. I think what had happened in the end was Malema got the better of himself. He became very, very arrogant. He was like somebody who was completely drunk on power. And he became a political bully. He didn't know where to stop. He was 30 years of age, and I guess all of us with so much power, so much wealth, so much means, so many resources at our, our fingertips, we probably would have turned out the same as well. Because Malema effectively lost the run of himself. So if you stood up against him in the ANC Youth League, your branch had to be disbanded. If you said anything against him, you were out. He became one of those awfully dictatorial figures. And don't get me wrong, I'm not running away with public sentiment that says he was a dictator. But he had that aspect to him. So here he is now sitting on the fringes. The problems within the ANC have not gone away, however. Everybody's of the view that let's applaud the fact that Malema is gone. Malema is not gone, but nor are the problems. The problems that allowed Malema to come up, the masses are still there. Somebody else will step into Malema's shoes if Malema doesn't come back. Somebody's out there thinking, okay, the guy was spot on in a lot of respects. And that's the thing with Malema. He said a lot of things that needed to have been said. He said things that a lot of the ANC senior leaders, senior rank and file, were too cowardly to say over the last few years. This country is unsustainable. It's the, the wealth is so unbelievably skewed. The Gini coefficient is embarrassingly high. What's the solution? Is it nationalisation? No. Malema's messages were absolutely spot on. His solutions were always very questionable, in my view. Others will disagree with me. But that's where he will always be remembered. He's, this guy is not going to be forgetting very, forgotten very quickly. That's why he had massive appeal for the masses. Malema was able to give the finger to everybody, to his own party included. And listen to what he said last Sunday in Pumalanga. He, there was a rally there and he turned around and said to people who were present, you know, the ANC has to look after you better. We cannot have this thing where every few years they're coming along to say, we're going to give you education and then you're only good for a promise like that when it comes to election time. Two or three years after election, do you have education? No, you don't. 
We have to keep the comrades on their toes when it comes to promises, and all that on it went. It's a very dangerous kind of character to have on the fringes of the ANC, criticising the ANC, because Malema still has a view. He's not over yet, and I certainly wouldn't write Malema's political obituary. As I say, the, the lack of leadership is still evident within the ANC. The masses are still there. The, the social environment that created Malema has not gone away. And the biggest problem of all is that Malema wasn't the problem. Malema was one of many problems within the ANC. I remember, and I guess all of you will remember, at some stage in September, Malema's first hearing in front of the disciplinary committee took place in the Tuvi House. And a, hundreds of youth gathered outside and they created havoc. And the TV cameras from all over the world were there. You remember that moment? Yeah. Whenever it was, the first appearance. And at the time, I was doing a lot of interviews around the book, and I remember thinking, well, if anybody was flying to South Africa this morning, they would think it was the sitting president of the country, rather than the youth leader that was under attack. It was the top of the morning news. It was all of the bulletins on the news. It was caused the traffic to collapse in Joburg, so the traffic guys were talking about what was going on in the Tuli House. Then it was the first item, and the second item, and the commentators were talking about it. And that's where it was so evident we'd all lost sense, we'd all lost control of ourselves even, we'd lost the plot completely. Malema was only the youth leader, but the ANC indulged him to this point that he became much, much larger than the ANC. The, the, and I've lost the point I wanted to say to you very quickly, but the, all of, the, all of the, the aspects that were there to try and get rid of him, every single one of those are still in place to this day. It's very hard to imagine that, sorry, I know the point I was trying to make. That same week, when everything was unfolding in the Tuli House, the ANC was putting the final nails in the coffin of the Protection of Information Bill. Malema had nothing to do with the Protection of Information Bill. It was the ANC. It had nothing to do with the Youth League, it was the mother body. Not everybody agrees around the Protection of Information Bill, or not everybody's against it. It's a very divisive piece of legislation that they're trying to ram down all of our throats. But the point I'm trying to make is that he was not the guy who was epitomised the country's problems. The country's problems still reside within that ruling party. He talks about nationalisation. He was able to talk nationalisation because the ANC has allowed this country to go untransformed. And it's an awful pity that the debate got bogged down these last few years in nationalisation or anti-nationalisation. A far healthier debate would have been on transformation. A debate that could have taken us somewhere. Because the bottom line is, even though the ANC says they're not going to nationalise, we're all he already heavily nationalised. Very, very heavily nationalised. The state-owned mining company is one of the biggest secrets of this government. They will not tell us how many licences they're taking in. They will not tell us who's funding the state mining company. They will not tell us where they're going to go with it. And as somebody once said, it's another form of BEE. Because the skill you and I sitting in this room don't have it, we're not engineers. The ruling party and the government has to go out and find their partners in the private sector to help them mine. So it's like another form of BE all over again. And what it potentially can be is another huge vehicle for corruption. If you think of the figures involved in the state mining company, they're going after coal, they're going after platinum, they're going after coal. Very, very big, big, big resources, strategic resources, money resources. You look at the ruling party calling for a state-owned pharmaceutical company, nothing to do with Malema there either. You look at the royalty taxes and the super profit taxes that are coming in through this nationalisation feasibility study that their party is discussing right now. You look at the national health insurance, something we cannot afford, but which the ANC minus Malema wants to go through. It's not him. So what I'm not trying to absolve him, what I'm trying to say is don't, don't for anybody in this room who might, don't sit back and think that all of the challenges are over and done with without Malema. If in five years' time Malema was to come back, and in the meantime have taken a good dose of humility, have looked at his own mistakes, have decided or agreed that he had gone wrong, have maybe had a look at some of the very allegedly, and I have to use the word allegedly, corrupt practices that he was involved in. If he could turn some of that around, Julius Malema would have been superb. Because he, he came up at a time when there were very few visible leaders out there. It's very easy, like you said, it's very easy not to listen to him. It's actually very easy not to like Julius as well. The guy has his problems, but he's certainly got his good points. The problem is the, the radicalism, the problems are the extremes, the problem is the way he was given this kind of power. And I'm going to leave it there, and I hope we can begin to have a Q&A, and I'd like to set the man in the second row with the blue shirt to tell me what it was that really captured his attention during the, the talk. Yes, you.
Mm. Mm. There was a lot of us that made you giggle. <laughs> no? Mm. And I just a big smile go across your face a few times. Well, I just... No, I disagree with most of what you've said. I think I'll just give you a chance to give it to the floor, then I'll say what I want to say. No, let's just hear it. Okay, well, I think uh, what I believe there's been an unfortunate sort of conflation of Julius Malema's personal sort of problems and the validity and legitimacy of the issues that he raises. I think from what you say, um, nationalization and sort of, you know, fast track land reform may not be the solution, but the levels of poverty in the country point to a need for certain transformative elements. But that's what I said. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying. I, I yeah. disagree with you. I don't no, but that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, we're saying the same thing. Yeah. I'm saying he said the things that needed to have been said. Exactly. But I'm not sure that his solutions were the solutions that he needed. And I agree with you. Okay, we're What do we disagree on then? What else? <laughs> <laughs> you can think about it and let somebody else ask a question. Yeah? yeah? document on um, what is to happen with the um, state mining company has been very clear. They have said that it would be housed under the Industrial Development Corporation. They have said how it would be financed through a certain vehicle in the um, Industrial Development Corporation. And they have outlined how a, a sovereign fund would operate um, and actually to, to, to take the state's take from mining. I think that um, the there's an unfortunate confluence of issues and um, between what we have said. Never, even in the ANC Youth League's document, do they propose nationalization, which is defined classically as expropriation without compensation. That document, that document actually explains a sort of resource nationalism, a very extensive resource nationalism, it's true, but um, it's never is it, it, um, it, it said in that document in the, in the exact okay. form. The other thing that I just want to say is that um, I agree with you that the GDP provision is too wide. I agree that the, the income distribution is embarrassing. I agree that um, there's a discussion to be had about transformation. But in a resources economy, and resource companies compromising and comprising the bulk of the um, the, 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 the companies on the JSC that created this economy. Um, it, it's a good place to start um, in, in resources to discuss how equitably the state can um, recoup itself. Because South Africa is an anomaly. Okay. Nowhere do you, not, do you have the state not recouping itself. In Ghana they take 10%, in okay. Norway they take great amounts, in Chile they take great amounts. Okay. South Africa has, has, has let this um, resources thing and um, go on too far. And um, I think history would be grateful to him as well. He's raising the issue, yeah. but his character and is not okay. Let me just combine what you're saying about the state mining company and in terms of the funding. Um, you said there's a vehicle within the IDC. Yes. Not true. The country doesn't have the money to fund. And I'm not sure if you're aware of the discussions that took place between government and the Russians to fund the state mining company. And when the Russians asked for 51%, the government backed out. They've now gone to two other international partners to fund. We don't have the money to fund it. I'm aware of discussion with Jeffrey Penner, the head of the IDC, and um, I'm aware that in the, in the nationalization document, which I've said in the There are two different things. I think we need to be mindful of that. In the, in the research document. Okay, that's different to the state mining company. Completely yes, I don't know why it's okay. different, but there's a proposal, a specific proposal, yeah that the ANC is making on how it should be financed and where it should be held and how it should be institutionalized. Okay, but that's already exists. Remember, it exists since April of 2010. Okay, so it's already housed, it's already up and running. The point I'm making is that we are already half nationalized. I agree with you, nationalization is a very big term, and I think we all get very emotional about it because it can spell so many things. Julius's plan was always 60-40. He was foolish that he called it nationalization. He should have called it a PPP because that's effectively what it is. I think nationalization people thought 100%, which was never that. Just let me correct you on one point. You said that Julius's document or the Youth League document never mentioned expropriation. That's true. Julius overshot himself, and he came out then and started calling for it himself. So he veered off the against the Youth League document. But to come back to the state mining company, the government has agreed, acknowledged, 
itself that it doesn't have the money to fund it. It has to go abroad to get it. Remember with platinum in this country, we have mined so far beneath the soil that it's very expensive to, to extract platinum in this country. It's much, much cheaper in Zimbabwe, where it hasn't been mined to the extent that in South Africa it has been. So therefore our costs are absolutely massive. It's becoming more and more difficult because our technology, we're going a technical route rather than a human route, massively expensive. So when the Russians went out of the equation, that was halfway through last year, there are two other international partners who are talking. The South African government cannot do it on its own, the money is not there. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, not at all, so I'm not sure why we're the game is there, but it's, we have to get money to do it. They have to make it work ASAP to keep you this dilemma off the back. That was the whole reason to try and accelerate funding for this, to show that there could be profitability, it could turn around. My point is that if it is a public resource, in which it is a state mining company, we should have more information about it. I do not understand why we can't see how many licenses, know the licenses that it already has, know where it's going to be in the next two years in terms of the licenses that it will appropriate, will they pay for those licenses, who will they bring on board. That's a public discussion, we should have that. They're public resources. And then we have to decide what part of public we want and what part of public we don't want. That's the point I'm making. Do you understand what I'm trying to say in that? That it needs to be more transparent. It's called a state mining company, not an ANC mining company. And this... Yes, that there are proposals. Sure. That are out about how it will be housed. How but it's already housed. It's already up and running. That's what I'm saying to you. None of us can get information. It's already there. It's functioning. You know I mean? So it's not a proposal about where it will be housed. It's already housed. It's already mining. It's already gathering partners. It's not mining. It is mining. No, it's not. It's mining coal. It's what, it's what shares in, in public entities, but it cannot mine itself. It doesn't have the capabilities to mine. It is mining. The state mining company has is mining. Okay, I think we should move on, and I'm happy to chat to you afterwards, and I'll show you the, the documentation on it. Any other questions? said that if Malema can do this in five years' time, if, if, mm. if the power is an aphrodisiac, so it's going to take him to step away mm. and control that power a little better than he is at the moment, do you think, um, from spending so much time with him, that he can do that? I don't know. Um, I think what we saw with Malema, Malema was just, he got the sentencing on November 10 last week, he was told he was being suspended for five years. That was a very, very harsh blow on the part of the party, because Malema's 30, and in the ANC you leave the youth league at the age of 35. So short of expelling him, they couldn't have given him a worse message to say, actually, we don't want you here. I firmly believe that what the ANC also did at the time was to put the ball into Judas' court. You know, they didn't expel him, they could have, but they didn't. And there was almost a point where I felt we were saying, okay, now come back, respond to this. If Julius had turned around to say, you know something, I think you're right. You've pointed out where I've gone wrong. I do want to stay in the ANC. I'm willing to talk. I don't think we'd be having the conversation we're having today where they've gone through the whole appeals procedure and it's taking up so much time and money going through this. Julius didn't do that. A week later he held a press conference and he declared his hand on how he was going to respond to the ANC. And he basically said he was going to war. Not the, not the cleverest way to punch. You know, then the party had to think, holy, and that's what Cyril said a couple of weeks ago. You know, he brought up that press conference. As soon as they'd given him a chance, Julius punched them again. And they brought up that very line that he was going to go to war with his party. I don't know. It's, it's, Julius is a very, very clever person. Um, thinks a lot on his own. He'll sort this one out himself. He'll decide what he wants to do. I do believe he's reeling from the sanctions against him. Five years is a hell of a long time in the ANC. If you think at the moment that we should all know, within reason, who the main contenders are to take Zuma's job if Zuma's job is up for grabs. I think, you know, because it is the ruling party and because they're going to rule this country for quite a, some time to come, I think we should know. I think it's not unreasonable to know. But everything is in such a state of flux that we don't even know who's going to come out victorious from Mangoon in ten months from now. So to wonder what Julius might look like in five years, sadly, is, is a guessing game that I wouldn't indulge in. I think there's an opportunity there for him because he's a born politician, this guy. I can't see Julius doing anything else. He may go into business, forget the cattle farming, that's also about business at the end of the day. But first and foremost, Julius Malem is a politician, and a, a very, very good one. If he wasn't a good politician, he wouldn't have risen to the heights that he did. 
you know, so let's let's see, um, but five years down the line, where will Zuma be? Where will Moklanti be? Where will Fikile be? Where will Tokyo be? And I think that's the other thing at the moment. We're all focusing on the big celebrities, the pop stars of politics, as your colleague calls them. And it's almost what we've always done. You focus on like the big five, the, the big big characters. But if you look at this province, if you look at Paul Mashatila, Paul Mashatila is a guy I keep my eye on all the time. And if you look at how Paul is rising through the ranks, but the media don't talk about Paul because again we're just talking on the top layer. And we did it a few years ago. We talked about Zuma and Becky. And nobody talked about the youngster from Limpopo who was coming up through the ranks. And it's a very dangerous game just to look at that very top layer. The ANC is one hell of a big organisation. Doubled in membership from 670,000 in 2007 to 1.02 million today. There's a lot more going on in the ANC than just Julius Malema and Jacob Zuma and Montlante and four or five others. It's a pity that the media is not given to us. I don't blame the media. I'm one of the media myself. But it's, it's very difficult to penetrate down. It's very difficult to unpack all of the big issues because the issues change day in, day out. Yeah, it's, 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 com it's complicated, as I call that chapter in the book, for good reason, I think. Yeah. Sorry, forgive me. Uh, sorry, sorry, I saw the hand going up behind, sorry. Uh, on, on the, the initially, I, I, I used to see Malema as a point that was being used by ANC to champion some of those issues which Zuma could not come out in the open and say themselves. But he later, as the power he was getting strong and strong, didn't he at one point realize that now they are, they are feeling threatened? Well, some of us would foresee that now they just want to look for a loophole. Maybe they are whereby they can just start bouncing back on, on Malema. Malema was, do you believe Malema was, didn't foresee it? <coughs> But it was now at the stage where by one day also to challenge. Okay, if I if I understand you, are you saying that there was a point where he was being used as a pawn and then he came out as his own man leading from the front? Mm -hmm. yeah. And he didn't foresee the what would come down the tracks against him. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, remember Julius Malema is the most fearless, fearless character that exists. I mean Julius is very, very fearless. Afraid of you. You cannot you cannot, you know, put this guy down like you. So much so, I mean, he took on the man who holds the two most important positions in this country, which is the president of the country and the president of the ANC. A very high profile position, wasn't afraid to take him on. So I don't think Malema ever thought about the challenges, because I don't think he really does. I'm not saying that he's short-sighted, and I'm not saying he's not thinking through clearly enough. But I think what Malema was doing was Malema was looking to December of this year. He was looking to Mango. And what Malema wanted to do was massive. Malema effectively wants to take over the ANC by bringing in this generational mix. Generational mix is about bringing in Fikir and Galula as Secretary General. It's like the ANC Youth League. If you consider, nothing changed in the constitution of the ANC Youth League from 1991 when Peter Mokaba refounded it again after Ambani. The constitution remained the same. The powers vested in the president remained the same. The only thing that changed for the Youth League was in the early 2000s they got the block vote to vote within the ANC. But pretty much everything else changed the same. For me, what Malema has shown me is that the position of ANC Youth League just needed somebody like him to come along and manipulate it. It was a position that could hold huge, huge power. Nobody did it before then, and Malema came along and did it. And we've just seen the kind of power that the ANC Youth League can have with somebody like him in the driving seat. I think the same can be said for the Secretary General of the ANC. I think it's a position that can be hugely important. And I think if Fiki Limbalula gets hold of that position, I think we'll see things change drastically. And I think that's what all of this was about. I mean, this was a massive fight. I think it's often under, underestimated. A lot of people often ask, you know, did Malema want to be president? Did he want to be president by 2025 or 2030? Not even just asking me, but there were comments that came out in the paper. Malema genuinely was not thinking beyond December because he knew it was one hell of a battle. And look at the battle it was. It was the battle that cost him his political life. It's not because Malema was pro-nationalisation and pro-land reform that he's suspended today. It's certainly not because of the alleged corruption charges against him. It was purely because he was such a threat to him. You know, if you think of it that way, so it wasn't, I don't believe that Malema was ever a pawn. I think it suited Malema to stay on that front line to be the foot soldier so it would take him where he wanted to go. I don't believe when he started out as a foot soldier from 2008, even before then, in the run up to Polokwane, that he was thinking, okay, this is my plan, and by 2010 I'm going to be here, and then 2011, 2012. I don't think so. 
I think he watched it, and the point came when he thought, okay, now I'm in. And that was post Polokwane, it was post Zuma coming into the presidency. And then he realized the possibilities that could take him forward. But he stopped, as I say, I think Malema got to himself at the end of the day, that he didn't think, he is fearless, and he was pushing and pushing. He didn't box very clever at the end of the day. If what he wanted, the bottom line was to see through Mango, then look at him now. And if you think of you in the last few weeks where he did have opportunity in the last few months to come back and play this one differently. Can you imagine an SABC interview or a rally if Julius Malema stood up, gathered hundreds of thousands in front of him and said, I'm sorry, I boss you right, I shouldn't have done it. I listened to the ruling on November 10 and I couldn't but agree, I did lots of things wrong. He would have floored the ANC. He would have stolen the thunder, they would have been speechless and they would have taken him back in. And then he would have been on track to continue where he was going. So in the end, he just wasn't thinking clearly. He wasn't boxing very clever. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Does it? Okay. I just wanted to ask, so in terms of, for instance, what you just pointed out, what you were saying, like Julius Malema was his own man, you know, sort of propagating his own ideas, like resource nationalization and uh, land reform, separated from ANC policy, <laughs> like, you no, know, Zuma always came out to say, you know, it's not ANC policy nationalization. Now, what do you think of the recent events, you know, where the freedom front, agriculture, the British agriculture music came out to say, you know, 40% uh, of whatever, I'm speaking to people. Yeah. And Zuma actually came out to say, no, I mean, uh, it's a distortion of his trend. The ANC itself, the way they responded to that land reform issue, uh, still, you know, sounds typically Julian's, even if he's not in the picture in terms of claim. I lost you a little bit at the end. Just go again. Um, Just at the end. I was uh, saying the way the ANC has responded to these yeah. comments and some of the, you know, fund organizations is typically Julius, even if he's out of the picture. What do you mean, typically Julius? No, in terms of like, you know, his arguments on the disproportionate ownership of land mm -hmm. in South Africa and the mm -hmm. need for quicker sort of mm -hmm. reform mm -hmm. is still the same message that's coming from the ANC mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. Julius at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Look, I think, I think the, lots of people came out against Mulder, and rightly so. And I think Sabiro was brilliant to paint a picture of half of his brain. And yeah, I mean, I would expect the ruling party to come out as they did, and I would be very disappointed if they did anything short of that. They had to. It, you know, it was a bit, a bit crazy what the guy had said. Think about it. You know, he, he deserved what came. But I think if this ANC government was really serious about land reform, they wouldn't be so far behind on their agenda of land reform. They gave Malema the opportunity. Oh, so it's a legitimation of what Malema actually was saying, that he was right in terms of land reform. It actually brings him out as someone who is legitimate. Well, I suppose it's brought the debate out, but nobody ever thought Mulder didn't think he would be doing that. You know what I mean? And I think the other thing that's missing in land reform, that I don't think anybody who reclaims land is just looking for the land themselves. I think transformative justice in this country goes beyond land reform. I think anybody who wants to reclaim land would like the opportunity to be able to work off it and earn off it and live off it. And I think that's what people want when they want justice after a party. They want better lives than they had had. And then if you look at all of the lands that it, the land that has been returned to people, and I couldn't take on land in the morning. I wouldn't have the skill to do it. I wouldn't expect others to as well who haven't been properly trained. But there's something fundamentally wrong in your country where we're net importers of food since 2007, 2008. We've got a delayed land reform program. We've got sky high unemployment, entrenched poverty, and the climate that we have. Imagine if we had a comprehensive policy where we're giving back the land, we're training people to use it. They learn to live off that land. They can improve their livelihoods because they can sell through co-ops to the state or whatever it might be. But everything is in silos. You know, we're, we're not thinking cleverly. And Malema should have even been a bit wider in his thinking to think how best can we do this. All of those things, really clever, creative policies could help this country go a hell of a lot further, even if Julius Malema would ever have taken it by jumping on a soapbox calling for land reform only. Yeah, because for me, I mean, the unfortunate part is what I'm saying, is that the land reform issue becomes very racialized Precisely. when people thought Precisely. it was becoming de racialized. Because when now it comes to the disproportionate yeah. ownership, it becomes a race issue. Yeah. And yeah. you find that mostly Africana sort of, you know, dominated farm organizations came out in defense of Moody. Yeah. And the black sort of uh, landless and, you know, yeah. 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 Now, I firmly agree with you, and I think it's an awful pity that there isn't a bigger spotlight put on all the failed farms. You know, men and women and their children who really want to make a go of the land that's been handed back to them, and they've been never given the backup to do it. That's a real shame, a real, real shame, I think.
and it, it's the story that goes untold so often. Yeah. Mm, my question was, uh, I'm probably one of the few people who believe in, uh, in this room who believe that Marema is not a bad guy. He's and not a? A bad guy. And uh, uh, I fail to understand when people say that his quality is bad. Because, I mean, this guy was just uh, defending a view of many people, many South Africans. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Marema will still be relevant, so long as those views are relevant in South Africa. Uh, we've got many African countries which are managed by Africans and black Africans and which are doing pretty good. So I, I feel that what Malema is trying to do is not to do probably like what other leaders who have been in South Africa since the apartheid era ended are doing. Yeah. He wants to do something different. I think Malema represents to them a, a kind of new Steve people, a person who doesn't want, just want yeah. a 50-50 negotiation, a person who just feels that this is my house, and they need to stand and say, this, we need this, not to, to listen to this person who came in my house and say, I need to give you this, do you understand? <laughs> so I, I feel that I don't see how people say that Marema is a good bad politics. I don't see how his politics is dangerous, because I feel that it's legitimate, maybe. Okay, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. And I'm going to ask you to bear with me while I read something of what I want to read today. Okay. I disagree with Milana's politics where I see Two facedness in his politics. I firmly believe, and I'm with Malena on everything he says. Everything he says needs, needs to be raised, and you make the very good point. He is relevant. He has relevance for a lot of people. Absolutely true. And there's no wonder, because as I said earlier, he, he was the only one who was talking to millions of marginalized people. He talked directly to them. He didn't talk to me. You know, he talked directly to the masses, always pitched his message there because he knew that there was a massive constituency in this country that had nobody talking to them at all. What I disagree with is when I look at evidence that points to a young man, 28, 29 and 30 years of age, who's not supporting a huge big family, of course he's supporting an extended family, which is a single man with one son. And if I look at the greed that he was caught up in, and the amassing of wealth from Polokwane, the way he directed the public purse in Polokwane, and if I look at that and I hear this message about let's share the wealth, and then I look at how he walks his own talk. Something's wrong for me. If I look at a man who's wanted to open things up in his political message, and then at the same time he wants to treat the ANC Youth League as his fiefdom, which he did in the end, and that's a fact. Something's fundamentally wrong. The two are not meeting. I agree with you, the guy has got huge, huge relevance. I agree with you, he's a very good politician. I agree with the things he said. It's his solutions and his, his practices I can't agree. And I'm happy for you to come back and challenge that, but I think we're going to differ. Yes. Uh, but one and another one open mistake that I see with South African politics is they think they are taking lessons from other Southern mm -hmm. African countries, mm -hmm. like when said Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. saying we don't want to go to Zimbabwe. And you're not going to Zimbabwe. But it's almost 16 years down the line, mm -hmm. yet the land is still in the yeah. hands of the few. So there's no progress there. Yeah. So later, I'm sure, when I win the few years, Next few years, we are still going to go to Zimbabwe. Yeah. I can foresee that. You think so? Yes. Yeah. I don't think so. I, I can foresee that. Yeah. I can foresee, foresee that. Yeah. Because Zimbabwe never predicted that. Yes. But eventually it did happen. Yeah. It's not predictable. But when you say you predict we're going to Zimbabwe, you're in the sense we're going to In Europe. terms of the way it learned, how it learned was eventually. Okay, so you need land grants. Yeah, in terms okay. of land reforms. If there's something is not done, what's the same time? Mm. Trust me, at one point it shall happen. I agree. It might not happen in the whole of South Africa, but some parts of South Africa. I agree with you. Happen. I agree with you. And that's the thing when people aren't hurt. Now that's where Malema is very dangerous, where he's urging people to do it. It's not the ideal way to go. I think there's a more peaceful way to settle this. I think government needs to come to the plate. They are sitting on it, which is a problem. I agree. I firmly agree. And I hear what you're saying that that point will come. But would you agree that that's not an ideal point to reach? That it would be better to have a. Happening and we don't like it. I know what you're saying, but like, would you agree that there is a better solution to this? Yeah. That it doesn't have to be a land grab. Would you agree with me on that? Yes. Yes, yeah. I agree with that. And that's where I think maybe the someone to focus besides my name must say it out. Then mm. maybe they will take a shit. Mm. Mm. Sorry. It's, it's been a sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm focused this way. Sorry. <laughs> not so much a question as something I wanted your opinion on. In my opinion, um, 
the idea of eliminating else from you know, the ANC is actually a good thing for the Democrats' plan. And I premise this on the idea that because he trades on, on controversy and he uses that as political capital, you have somebody from the outside who then can critique perhaps the more um, questionable aspects of mm -hmm. democracy and the way democracy is functioning in South Africa, and particularly as they relate to measures such as the um, Protection of Information Act and measures such as land reform. And I'm not saying that these are necessarily his own position points, but simply it's politically strategic for him to critique them. Mm -hmm. So I actually think it's a great thing that he's pushed out, not because he's a bad leader, but because he's a loud voice. And it's great to have that counterweight to to it's <laughs> But are you saying to have a strong voice outside? Yes. Okay, I don't think it should be at the expense of ousting somebody if it's not what the rank and file want, and that's what we don't know yet. How many of you here are familiar with ANC politics or members of you don't have to tell me if you're members of the ANC, but how many of you understand the ANC? Mm. Yeah. Would you agree that in the ANC it's the rank and file that decides on the direction of the party? Yes. Yeah. What we've been listening to over the last few weeks is some members of the leadership telling us they want Malev out. It's misleading when you pick up a newspaper and you see the ANC has fired Malema. The ANC hasn't fired Malema. And we don't know, and will not know, if the ANC wants to fire Malema until the end of this year. And that's when the ANC speaks. That's when the ANC goes to Mangoon, and that's when we'll hear the voice of the ANC on everything, on all matters, from policy to leadership to Malema, you name it. Go back to the NGC in September last, September 12th, last, September 2010, right guys? September 2010. What happened there was extraordinary. The nationalisation was not on the agenda. The agenda was crisp clear. The NGC is the halfway mark between conferences for the ANC to check the check of where they're going. What happened then was Malema, there were different, the Economic Committee, the, this committee, that other committee, what happened. Malema rallied his forces into the Economic Transformation Committee and he put nationalisation on the agenda. Now if you think of what happened at that time, Day one of the conference was a, at the NGC was a Sunday. The day is Monday. The day newspapers woke up the following day to say Zuma has battered Malema. Because Zuma said the youth must respect their elders. He didn't even say Malema. He couldn't even stand up to Malema and say, Malema, I'm talking to you. Just that one line and the media went wild. Malema was down and out. Look at that conference differently. Malema won that conference by virtue of the fact that he managed to push nationalisation onto the agenda so high that the leadership had to turn around and say, OK, calm. What we're going to do is conduct a feasibility study to tell us whether it's a good idea or a bad idea to introduce nationalisation to South Africa. That was the ANC at work. That was the rank and file speaking. So it's very mistaken to say, you know, it's a good thing to have him out. We don't know if he's out because we don't know what the ANC wants well, out. On the other hand, I can see that point, absolutely. But on the other hand, with issues such as protection of information, given your own research and his own, you know, alleged corrupt practices, he's a beneficiary that goes through and he's part of, you know, the ruling party. But if he's not part of the ruling party, and then he then is in a position to try and destabilize it, to give himself more political power. I don't know if that's an accurate perception, but I would imagine. Is say that again, that he's in a position to destabilize the... Destabilize... Uh, the uh, rank and file in a way to, to ensure his own political relevance yeah. is re-emergent. So I, in issues such as that, and particularly the protection of the Information Act, I, I genuinely believe that it's a benefit for him to be on the outside, at least for the state of the country. Perhaps not for him politically, but certainly for democratic climate and progression. Uh, I'm not sure I understand you. I'm not saying I disagree or disagree, or disagree. I just don't understand when you say it's of a benefit to democracy to have Malema outside being a loud voice. Yes. But remember, Malema is going to use his loud voice to get back in. I do think that's what's happening at the moment. He's already loving the, the branches, and it's, it's about his future. It's about an anti-Zuma sentiment that he's lobbying, actually, more than anything. 